So we made it all the way through. The last thing to touch on here are is applications of phylogenetics. Um, so before we get to this, what did you guys, what did I ask you guys to be able to do with a phylogenetic tree? Do you, do you remember? Just quickly review the things you need to be able to do. Anybody want to read anything? Do you have to read that tree? You have to read that tree? Yeah, not even for Donna. I don't even want to read that tree. Um, what about, you guys remember monophyletic groups or clades? What's a monophyletic group? Remember, I said it. <laughs> Remember this slide? So, if you take a group and you are using a characteristic that you find at a particular shared node, what's a node? Yeah, branch points, right? So, there's a node, there's a node, there's a node, there's a node, and so on. Just a branch. Or two, or a single lineage splits off into two. Okay? So, if, you, if I say I'm going to use a characteristic found in this node right here, in this case, we're using the, carry, uh, the characteristic of the amniotic egg. We'll talk about that later when we get to animals. Um, but let's say I want you to make a monophyletic group that includes all of the organisms that make an amniotic egg. You would have to include mammals, but this yellow circle doesn't really work. But everybody past that node would be a monophyletic group. What if I said, I want you to tell me all of these animals that make an amniotic egg and you circle with everybody except birds. Is that monophyletic? Not, right? Because you're excluding somebody that belongs in the group. What if I said, uh, give me a monophyletic group of, amni of amniota and you, you circled um, all these in yellow and you left out mammals and you circled amphibians. Not monophyletic, right? Because you've left somebody important out and you've grabbed somebody else that doesn't belong. Okay, so just be able to choose a monophyletic group. You'll see a question about that for sure. Um, nodes, branches, polytomy, you guys remember this? Too many things coming from the same node. Right, that just means that relationship is unresolved. If that relationship is resolved, you never draw a tree that way. Three lineages or more than two lineages from a single node would be polytomy. Um, sister taxa, next door neighbors on a tree, okay? Sharing a node and then um, Basal taxa are those that branch early and don't branch a lot, not a lot of diversity, and rooted versus unrooted trees. You guys remember the difference? Roots have, rooted trees have roots. Which means what? Yeah, it just shows that there's a common ancestor. One ancestor from which all the roots descended. So if you don't see a root, it's not indicating that necessarily. That's the main points from this. Oh, there was one thing I did not remember talking about that is important. And that's this, this little tip right here. Rotation of the nodes did not change the information of the tree. Okay, so there's a question about this too on a test. I want to make sure, wanted to make sure that we did talk about it. So can you actually draw this in here? Okay. Um, let's use this tree here. You see both the tree and the board. What if I drew, let's see. Um, let's just do it like this. There's your root. There's your basal lineage. So that's going to be the same. What if I take this branch off this way, put my polytomy over here, and take this branch over here and do that? So these trees look the same at first glance. Hmm? They're just flipped. Yeah, exactly. That's what rotating at the nodes mean. So where did I rotate it? I rotated it here, basically, but I just flipped it around. It didn't change the relationship. Okay, because remember, you're looking at the when you a good tip for the especially for the problems you'll see on your test. When you start looking at a tree, don't start here and go out. Start here and work your way back. Okay, so you can look at this. Let's go ahead and put some species on here. Let's call this A, B. Let me see the there's one E S D over here. Okay. Um this one's been let's actually do this. Sorry, I'm thinking on my feet and it's not going well. Let's take C and D out of the equation for now. And just make this like that. Okay. 
So A and B are closely related to each other because they, they share a really close node. You guys all see that, right? And then like F and G are more closely related to each other than either of them are to E. Because there's a shared node there, right? Oops. So um, these relationships, like how F and G are related to each other and how E relates to F and G, that's not going to change if you flip this around and put A and B over here or E, F and G over here. Or even if you move the F and D branch to the other side over here and have it coming off the same way, it still says the same thing because you're tracing it back from here. Oh, okay, I can see that F and G share the closest node, so those two must be the most closely related. I'll go ahead and give you a, a hint that there is a question that asks you about relationships and it gives you five trees to choose from and they all look a little different. Um, but you're going to look at all five of them and decide which one doesn't match. Okay, so they all say four out of five of them say the same thing and one of them says something different. All right, and your job is to pick out the one that looks different. You guys okay? All right. So use those relations, you use those tricks, use the nodes, use the close closeness versus distance. Remember, you can rotate if you need to. Yeah. So F and G must basically be symmetric? Yep. Um, well, so this is gonna get a little bit more complicated than what we're doing in here, but you could also say, like, let's say that F and G are two different species in the same genus. So that could be a genus, and this could be another genus. These would be closely related genera. Does that make sense? So you could also say, this is the part that gets more complicated, so if it's getting too much, tune me out. You could say that these two gene genera are sister. Does that make sense? Because it's all like relative as to the question that you're asking. So, but I'm not going to ask you guys that type of like, level of complexity. But does that make sense? All right, cool. I'm going to make sure I showed you the node rotation thing because I don't, don't think I said anything about that on Monday. Okay, good. I'm glad we're reviewing. All right, modifyly, we didn't, I told you guys to skip parsimony and likelihood and transitions and transversions. So um, I didn't take that out of the set of guy, I forgot, but don't worry about it. Horizontal gene transfer, we talked about the difference between vertical gene transfer, which is inheritance essentially horizontal gene transfer when you get genes from a different species somehow, right? Well studied in bacteria and other prokaryotes, um, but we're learning more about it in complex organisms, multicellular eukaryotes, and so on. Taxonomy you guys can handle, right? And then that brings us to application. So why do we do this? Why do people spend their whole careers organizing things and figuring these things out? We talked about basic versus applied science in lab, right, last, last week. Um, so sometimes it's just for the sake of information, right? We like to organize things. We like to put things in taxonomic groups, and so we do systematics right, to do that. But there are also applications, right? because there's, there's a limit to how much you can do just because. Right? Eventually, you can have to be solving a problem or um, applying it to some sort of uh, question. So a couple of good examples here. Applied science, uh, medicine, and public health. This is super important right now, right? So tracing things like the evolution of pathogens. Where did the coronavirus come from? How are we investigating that? Well, guess what? We're looking at the genome, right? We're sequencing the genome. We're looking at the genomes of other coronaviruses and trying to pinpoint where did this thing come from? The way that they do that is by looking at similarities and differences to other coronaviruses. They're looking at you know they're looking at genomes and coronaviruses that have been found in other animals, right? Trying to pinpoint the first the, the first animal crossover or spillover event, right? Is it a pangolin? Is it a bat? Right? They're still working on that. Um, right now, even more sort of timely is the tracing of the variants, right? Have you guys been hearing about that in the news? Like there are other variants of the coronavirus. We'll talk about this a little bit in our virus chapter, but viruses mutate really quickly. And when you get a new variant, it can have new characteristics, like it's easier to spread it in the case of some of these new variants. But how do they know it's a different variant? Phylogenetics. They're looking at the genome of the virus and they're comparing it to other known viruses, right? Other cases of the, this COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, right? So really important with that. 
it's, it's not just coronavirus, that's just the most relevant example, but things like um, pinpointing where did HIV come from, right? Where did, oh, let's just take one, Lyme disease, like where did it start? Those types of things. You can also use this to track spread, contact tracing, things like that. And it's all kind of related to phylogenetics. Um, so public health is a big one. Conservation is another one. So who wants to work in conservation biology? I know a few of you guys are interested in that. You told me in your emails. Um, when you are trying to conserve natural resources, your funds are limited, like they have in all kinds of science. I mean, sometimes you're faced with the, with the question of which group of organisms is it more important to apply your limited resources to, to protect. There's a pretty interesting story. Um, probably started about 20 years ago. Um, there's this question about lions in Africa. So there are lions all across the continent, but they're doing really well in Central and Southern Africa. So well that you can buy like a hunting pass and go to a game reserve and go shoot a lion and it's fine, right? Depending upon your moral position, but it's allowed because the lion populations are healthy. But in Western Africa and Northern Africa, they're not doing very well. Right, there are populations below not like two or three hundred individuals, so really, really low numbers, not doing well. Um, so the question became, why is this so different? Why are these lions doing so much better in South Africa than they are in Western Africa? Um, and so there were phylogenetic studies that were done, and as it turns out, it's a separate subspecies that lives in Western Africa, and it's more closely related to Asiatic lions than it is to the lions in the southern part of the continent. Not a different species, but a different subspecies. Um, regionally extinct in other places where it would have historically been. So they are different enough to be different subspecies. So then conservation biologists who work on lions in West Africa can say, here's where we need to concert our efforts, right? Here's where we need to focus all of our resources. We don't really have to worry about conserving all these lions over here in Central and Southern Africa, because they're doing fine. That subspecies is healthy and thriving and their numbers are great. But these, this subspecies, if they're a Leo Leo, is not doing well, critically endangered. It's actually a different, um, completely different classification as far as conservation organi organizations are concerned for these two different subspecies. But before the phylogenetics were done, we didn't even know they were different. So it looked the same. They look like lions. That makes sense? So it helps to inform decisions about what to do with your resources when you're working in conservation biology. It also talked about um, making sure that you have good genetic variability in um, captive populations if you're doing like in in the um what's the word i'm looking for like in vitro or in the lab type uh, conservation projects where you're doing things in aquaria or zoos or things like that um, how do you find out what their genetics look like oh you sequence their genome right parts of it. so yeah conservation is a good one and then agriculture is another huge area for phylogenetics because we need to know where our crop plants came from. Why? Why do we care where our crop plants came from? Well, if we know where the traits come from that we like in crops, like the ability to store starch or sugar, or pest resistance or drought resistance, if we know what species or what lineage of the ancestral plant those traits came from, it gives us information to do uh, bioengineering. Right, to start making new hybrids, to start building new um, genetically modified crops. And regardless of how you feel about GMO foods, um, without that type of, of research, we don't have enough food to feed 7.5 billion people. Okay, so that's important too. Um, so yeah, you may be, we may live in a place where you can make a decision whether you want to eat GMOs or not, but there are some places where you don't have that luxury. Right, you eat it because it's torn. You know what I'm saying? So it's really important for development of um, crops going forward with, with a changing climate and a growing human population. Um, it's also important for conserving lineages, right? We'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about plants, but um, as far as genetic variability in crops allows for more adaptability in those plants. So if the climate changes or if something catastrophic happens, you don't wipe out your entire rice in the world. Okay, so really a lot of important applications, so it's not just people who like to nerd out and read uh, DNA sequences for fun. Make sense? Questions, comments? Anybody like has a sudden desire to become a systemicist? 
All right, that's 20. That's all the content for exam one. How you feeling? Feeling like evolutionary biologists? You guys look at me like, what is she talking about? You've learned a lot. We've talked about a lot in the last three chapters, right? Enough to cover on an exam. 75 questions, including the bonus. Lots to talk about. But we're building, remember, all of this stuff is going to come up later. It's all going to be to keep coming up. The themes will return over and over to the chapters that we do throughout this semester. Yeah? Can you explain that is it all choice There are no short answers. Multiple choice, true, false, matching. Yeah, anything that uh, D2L can auto grade. Yeah, that way it just works out better for you and for me in the end. Um, but there will be some questions that are not like A. But maybe A, B, and C are correct, and like pick all the right ones. So they're a little more complicated than just you know typical multiple choice. But any you don't have to like come up with anything on the top of your head. All right, let's talk about viruses for a little while. I know you don't have to know this for your test today, today or tomorrow, whenever you choose to take it. So maybe it'll be more relaxed, a more relaxed conversation about viruses for that reason. All right, so um, this is starting us off on our biodiversity adventure. All right, so remember I told you we would do evolution and build a foundation with that, and then we would start talking about different groups of organisms. So we're going to go through, we're going to start with viruses, then we're going to move into prokaryotes, then we're going to go into uh, rodents, the single cell eukaryotes, then we're going to go into fungi. And then plants and eventually animals. So we're going to do each group in its turn. And we're going to do some pretty similar things with each group. We're going to look at origin, the evolutionary origin. Where did this group come from? Who are they related to? We're going to look at characteristics, okay? life history strategies, um, reproduction, nutrition, um, notable characteristics. So examples of, of these organisms that you may have heard of or that you should hear of that are interesting or that do something characteristic to the group. So that's going to be the pattern that you'll see in each one of these chapters. Okay, they're all a little different because each of these groups is very different, but that's going to be sort of the common themes that you'll see going forward. Um, so we'll start each chapter by just introducing the organism and talking a little bit about it and then going into some examples and how, how it applies to the bigger picture too. So nothing lives in a vacuum, everything interacts, right? That's biology and ecology in a nutshell. So we're going to talk about those relationships as well. So we start with viruses, um, and it's a, it's a good place to start, but it's also a little bit of a confusing place to start because we're not entirely sure that these things are even alive, right? So what is a virus? You guys know anything about viruses? What do you think of when somebody says there's a virus? Besides coronavirus. Well, you have Ebola and then you die. So that one that one killed you quick, right? But you think about things like um, maybe maybe like herpes, right? Or HIV or something that you have that stays around in your system. Is that what you're talking about? Like longevity. Um, yeah, and usually you think about things that make you sick, right? When you think about viruses, um, that there's a good reason for that because they do, right? So a virus is not a cell. It's not a cellular, it's a particle, which is weird, right? Because when we define life, uh, when you guys talked about cell theory before in bio one, which I'm sure you did, we talked about how the cell is the basic unit of life, right? A cell is the smallest, thing that can do all of the characteristics that make something alive, right? Like uh, grow, metabolize energy, reproduce, right? All the things, all those characteristics that define life, what is living, viruses can do some of them, they can't do all of them, which is why we don't even know, or there's some argument, whether they're considered alive or not. So they're on the cusp, somewhere between living and non-living. Okay, can viruses reproduce? You're shaking your head no, right? But how do more viruses get made? They do, don't they? 
How did that happen? They need a host. Yeah. So they can do it, but they can't do it alone, which puts them outside of that sort of definition of living. Um, and it makes them what we are going to call an obligate intracellular parasite. So a parasite is an organism that requires a host. Right? It has to get some form of its support to be alive from another organism. It can't do it on its own. And obligate means you have to. Right? If you are obligated to like pick your friend up and take him to work, if you promised you were going to do it, you're obligated to do it. You have to do it. Right? That's what obligate means. And then intracellular, what does that mean? What do you think? What is intracellular? Inside of cell. Yeah. So viruses can't do what viruses need to do to reproduce um, without getting into a cell that acts as a host. Okay? So that's why they're sort of weird in this, in this conversation about bioorganisms, living things, because they're kind of on that cusp. There's a huge diversity of structure, lots of different ways to reproduce. Um, we're not going to go into a ton of that because you can study viruses later or immunology or something if you're going in that direction. We'll talk a little bit about the evolutionary history of viruses, but the bottom line is we really don't know where they came from. What is that common ancestor of all viruses? What did it, what it is, what it even is, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then there's just some pictures of viruses you've probably heard of. You guys heard of smallpox? Anybody had it? No, because it's eradicated, right? You guys know what the word eradicated means? You're not even running it. What does it mean? Yeah, no cases. We got rid of it. How did we get rid of it? Immunization. Yeah, so we'll talk about vaccines too. Um, there's a picture of Ebola. That's a bad one. High mortality rate. Kills you quick. And there's HIV. Everybody's heard of that. Um, this slide is old, so coronavirus isn't even on this one. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, and this one's tobacco, mo tobacco mosaic virus. That is a plant virus. Did you guys know that other organisms besides people? Besides animals, can catch viruses too. So we're talk about that a little bit as well in this chapter. All right. So the reason the tobacco mosaic virus is important and significant, the reason we talk about it, is because it's the first virus ever discovered, ever visualized, ever seen. So before the 1930s, we didn't even know what viruses were. Okay. By that point in time, we had a fairly decent understanding of bacteriology and how bacteria act as pathogens. You guys know what the term pathogen means? Capable of causing disease in another organism. So pathology is like the study of disease and the disease process. And to generate anything is to make it happen. Right? So pathogen is just any organism that can generate pathogen, path, uh, patho, sorry, pathological conditions in another organism. So they can cause disease. Um, so we knew that bacteria could do that, but we didn't know what viruses even were yet. So late 1800s, we've got the invention of this uh, Pasteur porcelain filter, this contraption that is basically like the best small pore filter that's ever been invented. Okay, so that's important. You can filter out microbes like bacteria that are that you can see with a microscope. So if you can, if it, even if it's so small you can't see it with the naked eye, you can still filter it out with this porcelain filter. Okay, so that's a, a breakthrough. Um, and a couple of years later, this Adolf Meyer guy demonstrates that tobacco mosaic disease is transmissible to a healthy plant through liquid plant tag cells. So basically, first of all, why does anybody care about tobacco? It's a huge yeah, huge cash crop. Still is probably, right? I don't know if it's a crop, I don't know, probably, maybe less than it used to be, hopefully, hopefully so. But um, if you grow tobacco for a living, you care about tobacco mosaic virus. You can kind of see what it does. It sort of makes these blocky weeds. It, it kills the leaves of the tobacco plant, which is the part you're growing for if you're a farming tobacco. So that's why it matters. That's why people care. So this Meyer individual is doing research on this particular virus, and he, and he takes plant extract, so basically squeezes the liquid out of a, of a diseased plant and injects it into a healthy plant, and the healthy plant gets the virus. So they're like, Eureka, transmissible through this liquid extract, right? So they take the uh, Chamberlain Pasteur porcelain filter and they squeeze the liquid extract through it. So they filter out all of the pathogens they think, right? All the bacteria. And they do it again. They move the extracts from one healthy plant, from one sick plant to a healthy plant after that filtering step, and it still transmits the disease. So then they're like, dang. 
what is it? Nothing we can see, right? Because that viruses are so small that this filter doesn't get them. Okay, so that's where we are in the late 1800s. By the 1930, the um, electron microscopes have been invented, which allow you to see things at huge magnification compared to a light microscope. And that's when they found it. Some weird particle, smaller than you can see with a regular microscope, smaller than you can filter out with, a, with this Chamberlain filter, and it's pathogenic. So that's how viruses were discovered. And it was the tobacco mosaic virus specifically that they found first. And so that's why we give it a special place in history. Okay, so you will need to know why the tobacco mosaic virus is significant. Okay? All right, so what do they find? Well, uh, we said a virus isn't a cell, it's actually a particle. The name for that particle is a virion. Okay, so the term is a, a single virus particle is a virion. They're usually about somewhere between 20 and 250 nanometers in diameter. If you're not super familiar with what a nanometer looks like, um, a, a human hair is about 100,000 nanometers. So 20, even 250, pretty, pretty tiny, right? Really, really small. That's average size of a virion. Um, not too many years ago, we found some larger virions. They're about 1,000 nanometers. So that's still really small, but big for a virus, okay? big for a virion. Um, and that's what it looks like. They call it mimivirus, but it only affects amoebas. You guys know what amoebas are? You've seen those in lab before, maybe. Single celled eukaryote. Um, so this thing doesn't infect us. You don't need to worry about mimivirus. But it's, a, it's interesting. It's one of the larger um, viral particles that's been discovered to date. But most are too small to be seen with a light microscope. You need a scanning or transmission electron microscope to visualize uh, the surface structures and the internal structures. And then this image here just gives you a frame of reference for how big these things are. So this is um, animal intestine cells. Okay, so this is one single animal cell. It looks huge compared to these, right? These little sort of rod shaped and spherical things, these are bacteria, okay? So you've got animal cells here, bacterial cells really small next to those. This is the surface of one of these bacterial cells that is a bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria. Okay, so that's how small this thing is, sitting on the surface of one of these things, and that's how those bacteria compare to human cells. Okay, so that's just a frame of reference for what the size of these things, how small they are. Okay? All right. Um, three hypotheses of viral origin. Oh, you guys. This, I'm not going to go into a terrible amount of detail about this for a couple of reasons. It's kind of confusing, mostly. And also this. Currently, we don't know which of these is right. Okay, so we'll look at them, but I'm not gonna expect you guys to explain in any detail what any one of these means, okay? The first one, the regressive hypothesis or the de-evolution hypothesis says that viruses evolved from three living prokaryotes like bacteria or archaea that became adapted to a parasitic lifestyle and eventually just gave up the ability to live independently. So a symbiotic relationship that goes fully parasitic, okay? So that's sort of the devolution hypothesis, meaning to devolve, like you used to be complex enough to live on your own, now you're not, okay? Losing some complexity. So that's the devolution or regressive hypothesis. Progressive or the escape, which is kind of the cool name for this hypothesis, is that viruses evolve from pieces of genomic DNA or RNA, meaning something's genome lost a piece of nucleic acid that got outside the cell. At that point, in order to, to become a virus, they would have had to evolve their own protein code. Because we're going to look at the structure of viruses here in a second. Basically, they're DNA or RNA surrounded by a protein code. That's it. Super simple, okay, as far as structure goes. But if this progressive hypothesis or the great escape, right, um, actually had happened and you had sort of a piece of a genome that got outside of the cell, it would have then had to evolve that protein code because viruses all have a protein code. So then you have a progressive hypothesis. See how those are different? Regressive, you lose something. You lose some complexity. Progressive, you have to gain it. Right? So both of these are explanations for how we could have gotten to viruses. Um, and then the self-replicating or the virus first hypothesis says that viruses evolved before cells. Okay, 
um, from early self-replicating genetic elements, perhaps similar similar to transposons. And I don't know if you guys talked about transposons before or not, but those are the things we call jumping genes. You guys ever heard of those? Basically, it's elements of the genome that can move from one place to another. Um, there's some research that's been done that explains that that might explain some examples of horizontal gene transfer that we've seen. So basically, um, this hypothesis, this third one, would be that um, as RNA and DNA were coming into existence in like early, early life on the planet, that those self-replicating abilities of nucleic acids came along before a cell was ever even formed, okay, through chemical processes and whatever. So they're different. You guys can kind of see how, right? And, and each of them has support. So it's not like somebody just like, well, maybe this happened, right? There are studies that are going on to look at where these things came from. Why do we care about the evolutionary history of viruses? How is that important? Well, they kill us, right? So public health, right? It's interesting to know this. It's also interesting because a lot of times you can find signatures of viruses in our genomes, meaning like, who knows how many hundreds of thousands of years ago a virus uh, got into our the human genome and then stayed there, became part of our genetic makeup. Okay, so there's some really interesting questions and reasons that this matters. But to date, currently, none of these three has any more evidence to support it than the other. So they're all three well supported, but nobody wins. So we don't really know. Um, if you guys are interested in this, this is a pretty good video. Okay, so there's an Easter egg. So for next exam, maybe there'll be some bonus questions about these um, so that come from this video. But that's what that one's about. So we don't know, but we're working on it. All right, that's as much as we're going to say about that. You guys don't need to know anything in more detail than what is on this slide for, de for definitions, unless you are into it and you want to watch that video. Okay. All right, so what do they look like? Morphology, remember, means what? What is a morphology? In a, in a single word. Appearance. Appearance. Shape. And that, right? Morphology. So what does it look like? What is it made up of? Okay, remember it's a non-cellular particle of the virion. We've already covered that. Um, it consists of what we call the viral core, which is just the genetic information. It's either DNA or RNA in a, in a virus. You see both, examples of both. Um, surrounded by a coat of protein called a capsid. Okay, so you need to know what a capsid is. This is a lot of vocabulary. So if you look at this, this is an adenovirus. It's just a family of viruses, some of which have cause common colds and things like that. But this is just a very simplified drawing of what one of those looks like. It doesn't look too dissimilar to something like coronavirus, right? You see those spikes. You guys have probably heard of the spike protein or seen most of the coronavirus, right? If you haven't seen a picture of the coronavirus, I don't know where you live, like in a hole or in a cave or something. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? With the spikes on the outside. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So what you're looking at here is basically the viral core on the inside. In this case, it's DNA. So you've just got genetic material, nucleic acid. And then you've got this capsid, this, this brown sort of tan looking structure made up of all these little ovals. That's the capsid. It's just a protein coat. Each individual protein that's being made is a capsomere. Okay, so capsomeres are the individual proteins that are making up the capsid. And those capsomeres are encoded by the viral genome. So DNA and RNA, what is that? What is it carrying? What is it used for in any living thing? Genetic information, it's instructions, right? On the, for what? To do what? Right? Make proteins. Make proteins, yeah. So the instructions to make these capsomere proteins are embedded and coded by the viral DNA, okay? That's an important distinction because there are other things that the virus steals from its host cells, most other things. But the capsomere that makes for itself, okay? It uses its own enzymes and it codes for it with its own DNA. So at its very simplest, a viral, a virion consists of nucleic acid and its own protein coat, okay? Um, some viruses, lots of viruses actually, um, have another structure called an envelope. So an enveloped virus has another sort of coating on the outside of it, but that coating is most frequently made up of pieces of the host cell. Okay, so it hijacks cellular machinery from the host's own DNA, manufactures things like protein, host cell proteins, or uh, phospholipids. Why do phospholipids ring a bell in building an envelope? 
Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, cell membrane, right? So it's basically stealing the chemical process through which your cells make your cell membrane and making itself a little envelope, okay? That's pretty smart. It's a very effective strategy because that envelope now covers the outside of that virion. How do you think that helps the virus in its quest to get into a host cell? Any guesses? If you're a virus, you're trying to get into a host cell and you're covered in host membrane. Yeah. Seems familiar, right? Jacob, would you, did you have something else? Yeah, it's an evading detection, right, by your immune system. So your immune system is really good at picking up on things that look unfamiliar, that shouldn't be there. But if it's coded in something that looks like your own cells, it gets a little bit sneaky, right? Um, it also helps with attachment because viruses have to attach to the host cell first in order to get in. And part of the way it can do that is because those membranes are really similar, okay? So that's what an enveloped virus does. Coronavirus is an enveloped virus, so is uh, influenza. Okay, lots of familiar ones that um, we deal with are enveloped viruses. Um, glycoproteins. This is important. Okay? Glycoproteins are in the capsid, so it's just another macromolecule that's put together. Um, used for cell recognition. This, you guys, is where the spike protein in the coronavirus comes in. Okay, the spike protein in coronavirus and other glycoproteins are used to attach to the viral receptors. Okay, this is an important concept as well, but you will see this. What is a viral receptor? This is a receptor molecule on the host cell membrane. Okay, so from, even though it's called a viral receptor, it is a host cell structure. Okay, the viral receptor is. It is something like, um, in coronavirus, it's the ACE2. I don't know if you guys have been reading about this stuff, but if you have, that's what they're talking about. Okay, it's just a surface receptor that has its own purpose in that host cell. Right? It, ACE2 serves lots of different purposes depending upon what cell type it's in. So you find them in cardiac cells, and respiratory, mucous membrane. Okay? That's why the coronavirus is a respiratory um, virus, because these cells with this particular surface membrane receptor on them, the, protein, the glycoprotein in the virus attaches to that host cell receptor, that viral receptor. It's meant for something else, but the virus hijacks that as well and uses it to get into the cell. You guys with me so far? So let's say I'm a, a just a regular body cell, and I'm a host cell, and I've got this receptor out, and that receptor picks up molecules like, I don't know, calcium, okay? Because I need it. I need calcium. I need to be able to pick it up from the, from the surrounding environment and bring it into the cell. So let's say that there's a virus that has a glycoprotein on it like this, and that little ball at the end of that glycoprotein fits right into my calcium receptor, so when it binds, my cell says, ooh, calcium, and pulls it in. You see how that works? Viral receptor. Okay, so they're host membrane uh, structure that should be used for host function, but the virus can attach to it and mimic that molecule of interest and get in. Okay? Sneaky. Sneaky, sneaky. They're good at it. They're really good. We'll talk about that more here going forward. How do we do that? Very good. Great. All right. Um, we mentioned viral hosts. Viruses are incredibly diverse. Their hosts are just as diverse, okay? Meaning that every living thing has a virus that can attack it, okay? And oftentimes, their viruses are very specific to hosts. <clears throat> That's why it's so interesting when you see a spillover event, like we've seen with so many viruses that affect people that ultimately started in animals, because they can jump, okay? But it's rare. Exceedingly rare, but it's, it's weird, right? It's kind of strange. So something has to happen to allow a virus to do a host shift, because usually viruses are very specific to uh, their particular host. Now, most of the viruses that we deal with that have come from zoonotic transfer, meaning from an animal, have come from other vertebrates. So the vertebrate immune system is different from one vertebrate to another, but there's a lot of similarities. So it kind of makes sense that you could get a virus from a pig that can make it into a human, or a virus from a pangolin that can make it into a human. Okay, so it's not super out of the question, 
but it's going to be less likely that something like a bacteriophage, which is specifically targeting bacterial host cells, that's not likely to affect you. So you could be exposed to uh, bacterial viruses, viruses that specifically target bacterial cells, and it's not going to do anything to you because that virus is specific to that bacterial host. Does that make sense? Same thing with plants. If you get exposed to tobacco mosaic virus, you are not going to start getting patchy. Okay, it's not going to affect you because you don't have the, your you don't your cells don't even have the receptor, right? For those viruses to affect you. So viruses are specific to hosts. That's basically the point here. Uh, the other term, this is I've used the term bacteriophage. Now it's introduced in bold, so that's the term you need. Uh, sometimes we just call them phages, and phages are interesting for a couple of reasons. So they are. Uh, very small. They really do look like this. I look like a spaceship or an alien, which is super weird. But um, that's what their structure actually looks like. That's a whole bunch of them on the surface of a, a bacterial cell. These guys are also significant because we can use them in biotechnology. So we can actually program phages to deliver things into cells. So medications. Um, let's see what else. Um, one of the vaccines, I believe, that they're working on for coronavirus uses phages to deliver uh, RNA into the cell. So we can use phages for, for um, genetic engineering. If you want to introduce a gene, say, from uh, a pig into a bacterial cell so that that bacterial cell can then produce insulin, let's take the insulin gene out of a pig and put it in a bacterial cell, then they can start making insulin and we could use it for pharmaceuticals. We can do that using a phage. So they're really important in research. and. Um, uh, genetic modification of cells. So they're significant for that reason as well. So just know what a bacteria phage is. But those are the only ones that you need to know, like the special name. Okay. All right. So far, so good. Viruses are interesting, yes? I think. I think so. All right. How do they replicate? So again, there's a lot more detail on this than what we're going to get into in this sort of survey of viruses. But there are some similarities, regardless of the diversity of strategy or shape or structure of these things, there are some similarities between how viruses do things, different viruses do things. So we'll talk about that. Um, again, I'm going to remind you over and over that virus virions are non cellular particles. So they're not a cell, they have to be inside of the host cell. They can't reproduce independently, they fail at that classification of being a living organism. So they infect the host cell and they take over its internal machinery in order to replicate. So it's using your DNA. It is using your ribosomes. It's using your enzymes in many cases, your polymerases and your um, ligases and things like that. Okay, so it's hijacking all of this stuff. Even though it's just a piece of DNA or RNA and protein code. Crazy, right? That it can do this. Um, so first, like we talked about, virions have to recognize, attach to, and penetrate target cells. Talked about viral, viral receptors. That's the main way. Viruses bind the right cell, they bind to that cell, they make their way inside. Okay, lots of different strategies for doing that, but that's the basic way it happens. Once inside a host cell, viral nucleic acid is released and can begin to interact with internal cell machinery to produce new virions. Now, there are lots of strategies for this too. So if you're a DNA virus, you have to get into the nucleus somehow. So there's a whole lot of different steps. Okay, that get in. They help you get into the cell and actually start using the host machinery to make things. You're not getting into any of those steps. If you're reading the book, you don't have to read that part. Okay. There's just a lot more in the book than what we have time to cover. So what I need you to know is just that the nucleic acid is released inside the cell and begins to interact with ribosomes, with enzymes, with um, nucleic acids in the nucleic acid pool of your own cells, things like that. New virions are released when damage to the host cell causes lysis. So what happens is basically like a bursting balloon with confetti inside of it. That's just what this weird picture is. Um, a viral particle, a virion, infects a single host cell and starts pumping out viral proteins and new copies of those of that viral core, either DNA or RNA, inside of the cell. And inside of that cell, those, those viral core pieces, it's DNA or RNA, are getting packaged inside of those proteins, those capsomeres. Right, that are being uh, manufactured, coded for by the viral RNA or DNA, and produced by your own ribosomes. And then putting it all together in there until you have a ton of them. And then lysis. Do you guys know what the term lysis means? 
first. Yep, this. Okay. So um, it doesn't always it just explode. Sometimes it does. Sometimes viruses just cause cell damage to the point where the virus the cell itself explodes. When it does, obviously it dies. Right? This is why viruses are damaging to your tissue. Um, but when it does that, it releases all those virions that it just made in there. So what do those virions go do? They find other cells with those cell membrane receptors, right? Those viral receptors, and they get in there. So you get exponential reproduction with, with an uncontrolled viral infection. Um, so sometimes it's lysis, or sometimes your host cell will undergo apoptosis. Do you guys know that term? Programmed cell death. Isn't that funny? That's like one of those terms that sticks with you, kind of like mitochondria and power up and cell. Like, I don't know why that term just sticks. Maybe because it's a good word. I don't know. Apoptosis. So your cells become infected with a virus. Your natural killer cells recognize that they're virally infected and they come over and they start tagging it or they start punching holes in the cell membrane or doing whatever NK cells do and programming cell death and then the cell dies anyway. So maybe it didn't explode through lysis, but it died. When it does that, the cell membrane disintegrates, and guess what? Same end result, right? Virions out into the system. Okay, so either way it works. And then there's a sneakier way, because you know viruses are sneaky. Some viruses are released through budding. This is really weird. One virion at a time. You guys know what exocytosis is? Remember that from way back in bio one? Say again? Yeah, when things are exported out of the cell, right? So think about um, instead of bursting out the side like this, think about like a little bubble forms, okay, on the side of the cell. But that little bubble is made up of phospholipid bilayer, cell phospholipid bilayer, right? And it just blips off, okay? It leaves the host cell intact, but the virions are released one at a time. Why is that? strategically savvy. Why is that a good idea? Say again? Keeps, like Keeps your host cell alive longer. Maybe not forever. You're probably still damaging that cell, but you're doing it slowly. Why is that advantageous to you as a virus? <clears throat> Most likely to be protected. Pro yeah, you probably got an envelope going on, right? You've got some surface protection. But what were you going to say? I was going to say that. Yeah, longer your host stays alive longer, you have more time to reproduce using that host cell, right? Every good parasite knows <laughs> don't kill your host, right? Um, so there's a there's a an evolutionary trade off, if you will. There is a sweet spot of being a parasite. Let's go back to Ebola. Ebola is incredibly virulent, okay? Meaning it will make you really sick really fast. If you're exposed to Ebola, you know it in a very short period of time. You get super sick and the death rate with Ebola is really high, like 70%, something around that figure, okay, give or take. It's not an exact statistic, but it's high, okay? So it's effective in killing a host. But what does that mean for spread? Hmm? It's pretty low, right? So have we have we ever seen a pandemic of Ebola? No, because it's easy to contain an outbreak. It's probably going to kill a whole lot of people that it gets to, but it's not going to get very far. It's really easy to do things like contact tracing, if you know you're sick. What about coronavirus? How long does it take after an exposure before you might know you have coronavirus? Two days to two weeks. You might be walking around for 14 days before you ever even get a cough or a fever. With coronavirus, it's even sneakier because you may never get symptoms. You may be asymptomatic and you may still be shedding viral particles. Just because you're not sick doesn't mean you can't infect other people. That's a sneaky one, right? That's a better strategy for a virus than Ebola, which is like death and destruction. You see the end game, the long game, right? Now we have, I don't know how many hundred million cases and growing on the planet of coronavirus SARS CoV 2, right? That we know of. Good strategy if you're a virus, right? Like I said, every good parasite knows. So it's a balance, yes? You want to be uh, contagious, because without a host, 
you're going nowhere, right? That's a dead end for you as a virus because you can't replicate by yourself. So you got to get into a host. The more contagious you are, the more host opportunities you have, right? But you don't want to kill them that fast because then you, you're, if your host dies before it can get far enough to spread it to somebody else, that's also a dead end for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is a period of time when you are contagious to somebody who's genetically and maybe not contagious, right? Um, not, yes and no. So every virus is a little bit different. So you mean with SARS or with, with any virus? Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end of the chapter with antiviral medications, but you, there's not, it's not like a bacteria where you can take an antibiotic and it kills them or stops them from reproducing. You can slow it down in some instances, like you can take things like um, acyclovir for herpes simplex virus, or you can take uh, Tamiflu if you catch the flu in time, but it doesn't really stop the infection. It just sort of slows it down. Um, as far as like mono goes, mono virus, mm -hmm. and Not really. So you take steroids when you have mono to treat the symptoms. The steroids are going to treat things like inflammation, which is going to be part of what mono causes, right? Things like your swollen glands and fever and uh, aches and pains and stuff like that. So the steroids can help to dampen uh, that down. And then also, steroids also can uh, reduce your immune response, which is also kind of a trade-off because you want your immune system to be fighting, but sometimes those immune, your, the symptoms that you're experiencing are because your immune system is fighting so hard and that's why you feel so sick. So there's like a, a balance there too. So sometimes you take steroids to like calm down your immune system, similar to what they're doing with uh, COVID patients. Like a lot of the um, cytokine storms and stuff that we heard about early on, which is people's immune system just going crazy and that's what was killing them. Um, you can dampen that down with steroids too. So then treating the symptoms, the contagious period will eventually just work itself out with something like Epstein Barr, which is mono. But then Epstein Barr lives in your body forever, which is like it's kind of like chickenpox, right? Like if you get it once, you're not going to get it again because you have you have immunity to it. But Epstein Barr sort of hides. That's one of those where, like I was talking about, where you find evidence of viral DNA in your genome, it like sticks around in your cells forever. So. They're all a little bit different, but the, there's no real medication that stops you from being contagious with the virus. It sort of has to run its course. Different than antibiotics. Make sense? So there are treatments, but there's no cure for any virus. Really. Immunizations prevent, right? But they don't cure. So does that kind of answer your question? There's always like 10 different answers to questions in biology, but it depends. Depends on the organism. All right, so this is just a graphic illustrating the process of, in this case, an influenza virion getting inside of the cell, um, releasing its viral RNA, making proteins, making copies, making new virions, and then budding out. That's just a visual representation. Um, this talks a little bit about the viral envelope that uses the plasma membrane. That's what we were just talking about with sort of evading detection. Right? So that's a good reason to have an envelope. Um, and then we talked about this. What advantage does the virus gain by keeping the host cell alive? And it's a, it's a game of the number game, right? If you're a parasite, like the virus. All right, viruses and human diseases. Um, I, this slide, so I've updated this PowerPoint to include stuff about coronavirus a little bit later, but I didn't change this slide for a reason. So um, this is just an overview, right? So these are not all the viruses that infect humans and cause disease, but it's a nice little sort of, I don't know, representation. This article here that's linked in the PowerPoint is from 2012, and it's, it's aim, the, the, the purpose of the study was to identify all the viruses that affect humans, that it cause disease in humans, and they had to strike 219. And then the question that I had in here before 2019 came around, was do you think that number had changed since 2012? Well, now for sure, right? So new viruses appear, new viruses are discovered, new viruses uh, mutate, right? They jump, like in the case of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. You guys know why it's called SARS-CoV-2? Because there was a SARS-CoV-1 that happened back in the early 2000s. 
Um, that one didn't get as far. It was another another coronavirus, same family, very closely related, mostly contained to um, Asian countries because it had a really fast incubation time. It didn't have that 14-day window like the second version did. Anyway, just think you can take some information. All right. So the idea here is that we never know what's coming next, the next big one. So people who work in uh, epidemiology call it NBO, the next big one, because they're always waiting. The next one to come down the line. I think I just wrote this forever. Okay, we have time to talk about vaccines. Yeah, we got about 10 minutes. You guys doing okay? You're holding up all right? Worry about your test? Are you still listening to virus stuff? Or are you like throwing out things on? You can tell me. Doing okay? All right, let's talk about vaccines. That's a fun topic. What do you think? Controversial? Shouldn't be. Some of you are like, no. If you look at the science, it's not, right? But what about society? <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'll let you repeat that one if you want to. I'm not gonna. Um, yeah, uh, information is important, right? And misinformation and disinformation are dangerous, right? So we've seen that um, coming to light. So vaccines for prevention, this is so sad. I'm just gonna put it down. So I can get it to work again. Okay, so vaccines are by far the best tool in the defense against viruses because we don't have cures. Because we don't, there's no medication that stops a virus in its tracks and reverses an infection. It either runs its course and you recover or not. Right? Okay, so viruses are, are just like that. But we figured out ways to prevent infection in the first place designed to induce or remove an immune response and build immunity to prevent future infection. So you get a little exposure to teach your immune system what to do if you ever encounter it again. Okay, so most of you guys were probably vaccinated against all kinds of stuff as a baby. Right? You probably got your MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. Right? You probably got uh, DPT, diphtheria, polio, tetanus. Right? If you go step on a nail and it's been 10 years since you've had a tetanus shot, they'll give you a booster. Okay, so these are all probably familiar to you guys. Um, varicella, chickenpox. Anybody had a natural infection of chickenpox in here? A couple of folks. Most of you guys probably were vaccinated against it. They started doing that, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, depending upon where you live. So um, what they do is basically give you a little piece or something that looks like a little piece of a virus and teach your immune cells how to make antibodies how to produce these compounds that prevent infection, that neutralize an invading virus, okay? So vaccines can be made from live viruses, which are called attenuated. Attenuated means weakened, okay? And the term live, and is it really alive? We don't know. But we're calling it a live virus or an attenuated virus vaccine. Those are actually made with a weakened form of the virus, okay? These are less common than the other types because you can, they can be dangerous, okay? So what happens with an attenuated virus vaccine is that a virus is grown in a lab in some kind of tissue uh, under less desirable conditions than what you would find in the real environment, okay? So let's say you have a, uh, you're working on a vaccine for yellow fever, okay? And yellow fever thrives in human body temperature, okay? So 98.6 and around that range. So you take yellow fever virus, and you put it in some, I don't know, rabbit culture, rabbit cell culture in the lab, and you grow it for multiple generations in cold temperatures, okay, hypothetically. So what you're doing is almost inducing or selecting for viruses that only live at this cold temperature. So then you can take those viruses, make a vaccine out of it, inject it into somebody. It's enough of a viral exposure to yellow fever that they can build an immune response to it. But because they're weakened, in this, in this example, they're adapted to cold temperatures and you're injecting it into warm temperatures. It shouldn't be strong enough to cause an active infection. Does that make sense? Kind of. So it's basically like giving, it's, it's weakening the virus or it's giving it a set of conditions that are less than optimal. 
and making it mutate to those conditions. Why is that sketchy, do you think? Maybe it still can make you sick, right? It is possible. Sometimes they back mutate. So sometimes you get an infection anyway that can be bad enough to kill you. I use yellow fever as an example because that happened not that many years back. So we don't have yellow fever in North America. But um, it's a travel vaccine if you're going to certain places where it's, where it's um, transmitted. So that's a live or attenuated virus. Most of our vaccines are not that. Okay, if you are getting a live virus vaccine, your provider will tell you. So you know how they give you that piece of paper? They're like, here's all the terrible things that can happen to you. Just sign it, you'll be fine. Okay? They would they will actually tell you like this is dangerous if you're getting a live virus vaccine. You'll know if you are. Um, more frequently you see an inactivated virus vaccine or a molecular subunit vaccine. Okay, so inactivated means that virus isn't capable at all of causing infection. It's been completely inactivated or you're getting a part of it. Okay, so they've taken virions and they've taken them apart and they're giving you like half of it. Maybe they're giving you a piece of the protein coat. Yes? Um, and then molecular subunits is when they give you a little piece of the core. They give you a little bit of that viral RNA. And then you build a response to that. You build antibodies to that. And then the next time you see it, full, full dose virus, your body already knows how to respond. So your, your immune system works in such a way and the first time you encounter something, it takes your, your B cells, your adaptive immunity, a couple of weeks to really mount a good, solid antibody response to fight something off the first time. But the second time you encounter it, you have memory cells in your immune system, memory B cells, and they are like, hey, we've seen this before, and we know how to make antibodies to this, and they start pumping them out fast within a matter of a couple of days the second time around. So vaccination works because that's your primary exposure. But it shouldn't make you sick because of the way the vaccines are made. Then the second time you encounter it in the nature, your body knows what to do. Yeah. Uh, I like vaccination by taking virus vaccines and um, vaccination by using the shot. Yeah, being a booster. Yep. To get full immunity, to get your uh, antibody production ramped up to the point where it'll protect you against an infection. So they do like a vaccinated one first and like maybe a sub. Um, I don't think so. I think they're always the same. Yeah, so with the, with the COVID vaccines, there are different types out there. The, the two that are already being given are messenger RNA vaccines, so they're molecular subunit, and both doses that you get are the same. They're just two, they're just what, a month apart or two weeks apart or whatever the, the, the thing is, but they're both the same. I think that's probably always the case. <coughs> it's possible that it, there may be an exception, but I don't know. That, I don't know that if there is. Um, yeah. So important to know, inactivated or partial virus vaccines do not cause infections, although the live viruses can, not often, but it's possible. Um, and some viruses mutate really quickly, like the flu, which is why you need a new flu shot every year. Because they look at the best available data, they look at southern hemisphere data before flu season gets here, and they make vaccines ahead of time and says this is the best guess as to what this virus is going to look like this year, they vaccinate you against that. Right? So that's why sometimes you can get a flu shot, but you still get the flu. You guys have probably heard people say that, like, this is a bunch of crap. I got the flu shot and I still got sick, right? Maybe you did, maybe it was less terrible than it would have been, because right? maybe they got it partially right. So sometimes the match is like 50%, because it's the best guess. Um, that's the concern with the coronavirus too, because we have these new vaccines and they're developed super quickly, that work really, really well. These mRNA vaccines are um, pretty remarkable in their efficacy, the percent of infections that they prevent. Um, but the concern is the new variants, right, that popped up, the um, UK variant, the South African variant, they're different. But the question now is, are they different enough to evade the vaccine? Because it's mutation. But think about how quickly uh, bacteria mutate. Right? We watched that video with the plate and we saw all the successive mutations that lead to antibiotic resistance. Viruses are like that too. They're even more sort of like wild cards because they have to get into a host cell and then hijack the host's ability to make new copies of RNA and DNA. So think about all the uh, opportunities for mistakes to happen, right? You're not even using your own enzymes, you're using host cell enzymes. So it's possible and likely that you make more mistakes. So that's why viruses mutate really fast because they replicate quickly and they're doing it like on the fly in a host cell. So that's why you get mutations. Um, 
Oh, this is really important, right? That's why it's red. There is no evidence that links vaccines, vaccines with autism. How many of you have heard that? That it does. You've heard, you've heard whether you accept it or not, you've heard that though, right? It's been all over the news. There was like one paper, I don't think I put that paper up here. I don't, don't want to give it any attention. Um, but it was published, I can't remember the publication year, I think it was like 2010 or 2012, um, that said there was a link between the, uh, the measles vaccine and autism. And it sparked this whole like anti-vax revolution not too long after the publication of that paper was retracted. And that guy lost his medical license for falsifying data. So essentially it was bad science, misinformation, disinformation, purposefully uh, putting out bad science. And you guys have probably heard if you follow stuff like this in the last few years, like measles is on the rise. That is crazy. Right? It should have been going the way of smallpox, like eradicated. Like we can vaccinate against this again, this is very effective. And once you vaccinate enough people, you get to herd immunity. You guys heard that term being tossed around lately too with the COVID vaccine, the herd immunity. When you get enough people vaccinated, it protects those who can't be vaccinated. Right? Because you it's kind of like think about like ping pong balls on a table. If you hit, if you drop one ping pong ball and it starts bouncing and it hits all these other ping pong balls, you think about that as like infection. But if there if there's no ping pong balls even close, because nobody can transmit it, because everybody's vaccinated, you drop one ping pong ball and it just rolls off the table. Does that make sense? So transmissibility reduces the more people are vaccinated. So you didn't even have to vaccinate 100% of the population to get to herd immunity. Like we're a herd of sheep or a herd of cattle, right? That's what it refers to. So. Um, when people stop giving their kids their childhood vaccines against things like measles, and you start seeing cases of measles again, that's disturbing because we shouldn't see that, right? Because we have vaccines against it. So anyway, um, all of that is because of that one stupid paper that was released and then retracted. Um, and since then, there have been multiple studies, meta-analyses. A meta-analysis is like a study that takes data from 50 other papers and puts it all together and analyzes like millions of cases at the same time that says there's no link. So it's taken, I don't know how many millions of research dollars to go back and show evidence that this is not true. Right? So a little one little thing caused a whole ton of damage, but there's no evidence that vaccine cause autism. So making decisions about yourself or your future family or your current family, it's all good with the vaccine. Okay. All right, we'll stop there.